but I am ready. I have the tab open. I'm ready to hit mute as soon as it's up. I think we're live. If uh, if you can hear us in the chat. Hi, everybody. Say hi. I, <laughs> I don't I, know if I'm... Uh, I just... I always get nervous that something's broken. You know what I mean? Yeah. I no, it's... It. Um, I see it. I see it. It popped up. You've had a lot more experience in this than I have. I fumble my way through it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Thanks very much for coming along. My name is Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. And uh, I have with me here today a guest, someone I've been, uh, I've been following since 2012 or 2013, uh, when you were doing all kinds of interesting ship-related activities. I think you're the original ship renaissance man, Mr. Thomas no, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, hey, Mike. How you doing? Doing good. I'm doing good. It's a nice, uh, it's actually quite a sunny morning over here, which is surprising for, um, for order. Good. We have a, a cloudy evening here in Pennsylvania, and you're in Australia. I so, we, if we went outside right now mm. and took a slice of bread and laid it down, we could make an Earth sandwich. <laughs> You'd be on the we could do that exact again. opposite side. It's, why? Why are my friends on the same side? Uh -huh. You got to come visit. It's yeah. a very long flight. It's a very long flight. I have to warn you. Yeah, also, you guys have got all of the museum ships, you know, like, uh, you've preserved every battleship that ever went into service, for example, so I think Thank you can you. do a trip just looking at museum ships in the US. Oh, for sure, the, uh, USS New Jersey is near me, the Olympia, yeah. um, and then there's quite a few that I'd love to see preserved that are kind of mothballed down in Philadelphia, mm. but yeah, almost every... Every harbor you go into in the United States is going to have at least one or two museum ships. It's, it, it's like the uh, maritime aficionado's promised land. <laughs> Which one would you like to see the most Ooh, in man. all the U.S.? Uh, aside from the Queen Mary, which is... Aside from the Mary. Well, I, I figured we were talking military ships now. Yeah. Um, I, I would have to say one of the Iowas, just because okay. of the scale. I can't imagine standing on a ship that's... Uh, you know, so tall, so wide, the beam, what is it, like 120 oh, yeah. feet or something like that? Well, if you, um, I like to point this out, because like I said, the New Jersey, which is part of the Iowa class, mm -hmm. is uh, not too far from me. Like, if I'm picking somebody up from the airport, we pass it on the way back to the house. And I like to point at it, because it's, uh, I think, 900 feet long. So it's, it's give or take the same length as the Titanic. Uh -huh. I always refer to that as size of the titanic but obviously yeah. ships are measured by tonnage and there's people who like to call me out on that but it's the same length yeah that's important. as yeah exactly the um exactly. i've recently volunteered on a uh on a military uh museum ship that we've got down here yeah it's a corvette it's 200 nice. feet long and uh wow. it's about 1600 tons what's the name of it She's called HMAS Castlemaine. If you live in Melbourne, Australia, go visit because she's basically got Titanic's engine room in miniature. Wow. She's got triple expansion Dude. steam engines that are about a story tall. And you just try and imagine, and they Dude. still turn. They pump air through them. Um, and it's... Wow. I don't think it would have given the Japanese Navy a terrible fright. She's got one four-inch gun. Um, Iowa. Are you, <laughs> are you familiar with the HMCS Sackville up in Halifax? Yeah. She's also a Corvette, and uh, I'm just wondering how similar or different they are. To be honest, I, I, if someone in the chat could confirm this, I get the feeling that um, Sackville may have actually been this class of Corvette that was sold on, which is interesting. To the, to the was, she, was she Canadian? Yeah, yeah, Canadian Navy. Wow, okay, well, uh, this, this is... <laughs> I forgot. I, I, are we streaming right now? Oh my goodness! I forgot. Yeah, we're streaming. <laughs> we will. Uh, the, um... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to continue to derail this. <laughs> no, no more derailing, because today we're here to talk about uh, maybe quote unquote the forgotten liner, um, and one of those really tragic uh, maritime disasters yeah. that people are maybe familiar with but don't know a huge amount. I mean, where. Yeah, I, I preface this whole thing by just saying you neither you nor I, I don't think, are experts on this 
on this ship. So I just want to get that out of the way and say, we're not coming into this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Knowing everything. I, I, um, I was going to add that asterisk to this as well. I mean, I, I saw in the title you were, you were featuring me there, but mm. seriously, I am definitely not an expert on the Empress of Ireland. I know Mike doesn't claim to be either. So just we're enthusiasts who are going to be discussing it and commemorating um, the anniversary of the sinking a little late, but, still commemorating it nonetheless and uh just bear in mind that we are taking this from the enthusiast perspective yeah yeah absolutely agreed i mean um there's so much to know about the disaster and i think unlike titanic it's just barely been touched it just it's just the surface has been has been um has been scratched there's been some fantastic yeah. books released over the last you know 30 or 40 years on the disaster but not obviously not at that same scale um yeah as uh the the titanic or the lusitania so tom where just again i just sort of laying some context because it's kind of interesting what's your superhero origin story like how did you get into liners let them compare and contrast and where does the interest from the empress come from all right well the interest in the empress is a byproduct in my interest in uh ocean liners mm. i got into ocean liners thanks to the titanic pretty much the same story with everybody here yeah um when I was three or so, my dad had a 350 scale Titanic kit that was all smashed to pieces, and I was just piecing it together, having having fun with it. I didn't know anything about it, hmm. but I loved playing with that because while I'm on the floor doing that, my dad would be actually modeling a new plastic model kit at his desk, so it's kind of like a father-son thing. But um, after I was playing with that kit on the ground for so long so many so many different times my dad would be modeling he gave me a book the kids version of robert ballard finding the titanic yeah and i flipped through it still had no comprehension of what i was looking at i was i was three but the pictures were fascinating me yeah. and then we watched a night to remember and that really started to hook me on it so i, I think i would say i truly got hooked thanks to a night to remember yeah um and then James Cameron's film came out on my birthday what's, when what's I was turned. Uh, uh, I forget the name. Yeah. Yeah. It'll come to me later. But James Cameron's 97 film came out and yeah. it came out on my birthday uh, in kindergarten. And then we went and saw Mouse Hunt with Nathan <laughs> Lane. <laughs> the, the contextual change is huge. I, that you know, for, for um titanic was sold out titanic was sold out oh uh, I, I thought yeah. you meant we watched titanic and then we went and saw saw uh what was it mouse hunt <laughs> no i mean we didn't watch titanic we went to the movies and titanic was sold out so we watched mouth mouse hunt instead which is also an awesome movie but on a different level on a different very different level titanic. yeah yeah i think you've got a, a very interesting uh titanic superhero origin story well, mine is that what is yours? Mine's very funny. Uh, I think it's that I started out. Um, I started out in life in the in the in the nineties. At that, you know, when when it was a big thing to put your kids down in front of documentaries or play Mozart in the hope they'd become a super genius. Yep. Clearly didn't work. But the well, um, the <laughs> I, my auntie sat me down in front of a Titanic documentary. But it was the film by James Cameron. And she didn't realize, oh. and she left me alone for the duration of the film. And I, so you learned a lot of a lot of things about life. All, yeah, all all of life's lessons. I was like two or three, and it, it seriously from that moment I was just obsessed, especially the engine room. I think just the the motion of the engines, yeah. what have you. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it it did a lot. It brought the story to life. But um, obviously, the the Titanic is the lens through which we view. I guess disasters like the Empress, um, and I think it speaks a little to what the public, how they reacted to the Empress disaster as well. Um, almost uh, not, not, I wouldn't say desensitization, but yeah, it, just, it never had the grab. Right, it was what like a couple months before um, the First World War broke out, and I think the world had maybe yeah. moved on since Titanic. It was there were other tensions. Well, this was as you said. I think this was a month and a half prior to the outbreak of the First World War. Um, 
I forget the exact timeline, but I know Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated a month before the war actually started. Mm-hmm. So um, that puts that within like a couple weeks of this. Yeah. So the world's mind was elsewhere. When the Titanic went down in 1912, the world was happy. Mm-hmm. The world was having a grand old time. And it just came as a total wet blanket to the massive progress in technology, the pride that everybody was feeling in civilization. But now, yeah. two years later, there was a, a slight bit of desensitization, I'm sure. You know, we already had a massive liner get lost. Mm-hmm. Now, two years later, another one goes down. But also, people were becoming more cynical with life already. Mm-hmm. So, um, it also doesn't quite have the same allure as the Titanic did. The Titanic went down in two hours and 40 minutes, had all this time for drama to unfold. Uh, A lot of famous people were on board, influential people if they weren't famous. Mm. And uh, it was the first voyage. So many things could have gone differently and just dramatically improved the situation had they done so. Mm. But with the Empress, it was a total man-made accident it was Mm. two ships colliding as opposed to a freak accident with an iceberg and over the course of 14 minutes the ship just rolls onto its side and goes down yeah it's completely within the boundaries of canada as opposed to the open ocean almost like a um the vast expanse middle of nowhere type place Mm. it's it doesn't have the the romance of the Titanic, I'd and by this didn't point, have the time uh, to for those yeah. human dramas to play out during the sinking. Exactly, and that's not to say there wasn't an insane, intense amount of drama that unfolded aboard the Empress. I mean, if if you read some of the first hand accounts, it's it's chilling, it's terrifying, and it's tragic. Mm. But Titanic was a slow burn which allowed so much more to develop, whereas the Empress was a frantic scramble to save yourselves and your loved ones. Yeah. And not much more than that. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good, uh, <clears throat> great summary and a good point to maybe get started. What, what we've done is we've got a little presentation here together, uh, just maybe telling the story of, of CPR, um, uh, the Empress's operators. Um, and I, just a quick shout out as well, just while we get started to, uh, Chelsea, who is, uh, you can't see her or hear her, but she is here. Um, and she is Operating the chat. moderating the, the chat. So, uh, dispensing the band hammer as, as necessary. Um, yes. brilliant. thank you, Chelsea. Yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. So we'll be, uh, pausing and taking questions, um, a little, uh, later towards the end. Although have I... Has this stopped working now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> first, first technical difficulty of the of the, uh, of the day. Let me. Uh, what did you? What I done how? Let me let me pause this for a sec. Yeah. Boom. Sorry, one sec, guys. I have a. Uh, I've got this presentation lined up, and uh, I've started at the uh, at the back of the presentation, uh, which is a. Oh, that's the worst place to start. That probably was the worst place uh, to start there. All right, here we go. We're, we're good to go. Sorry, guys. All right. Um, fantastic. So the Canadian Pacific Railway, um, I, I think the whole premise behind these, these ships being that they connect the lines of the Canadian Pacific Railway across the oceans, right? So CPR was founded uh, in 1880. And as early as 1884, so within four years, they were already thinking about having ships connecting the lines. Uh, I've got a note here that says that you could travel at the height of the CPR from Hong Kong to England, which is 11,840 miles without leaving CPR transportation. Unbelievable. We talk the, um... today about experience design, you know, providing an experience, like a seamless experience for, for customers, for, for passengers of certain things. This is like that pioneering experience where you don't set you know you just have that standard of quality and experience the entire duration of your your journey which is fascinating with the um cpr that was it does date back almost as far back as canadian history in fact Mm -hmm. the um 
first prime minister Macdonald, he wanted to do a nationalized railroad like this, and it it did become the the CPR. Um, I don't want to step too much on your toes. Are you going to touch on like the other stuff they were building? No, no, I didn't no, get to see your presentation yet. <laughs> so, so I don't know what you have in mind, and I don't, and this is your show. I don't want to. But no, if, no, no, go, go for it. Whatever you want to, whatever you want to touch on, mate, go for it. I just, um, I thought, it, I really I think it's neat how the CPR was trying to provide the entire travel experience from start to finish. We, we saw this with other lines more recently, like in the last century, mm. um, such as Cunard, because Cunard actually ran an airline at one point. I don't know if they still do, but they ran an airline and they had hotels in addition to their ships, so that if you are going to take a cruise on a Cunard liner, mm. you could book your airfare with Cunard, you could stay in a Cunard hotel while you're waiting for your ship to depart, wow. and then your ship will take you to a Cunard hotel in another country, and then you would fly back on Cunard lines. So it was the same business model, but they were doing that in like the 60s, 1960s, whereas here we have the, the CPR doing that in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s. And um, very, they were very building, early. oh yeah, they were building some phenomenal hotels mm. in across Canada as well. Um, I don't remember if uh, what is it called, Banff or something. The 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 big, the big one in Canada. Mm. We have a lot of Canadians in the chat here. They'll know what I'm talking about, and maybe they can <laughs> call out which one I'm referring to. Um, Emma is not here. One time. She'd know. She stayed at it. Oh, okay. but yeah. There, there are some anyway. great comments coming through. By the way, we're, we'll, we'll uh, have a <clears throat> have a moment a little later on where we can address a lot of these. I think um, Chelsea is collating them all together so we can go run through and answer questions. But um, yeah. sincerely said that Canadian Pacific responsible for the Canadian Transcontinental Railway in a real way Canada wouldn't exist without it. Well, I love this poster because you can see that this was the you know the new world as much as the united states and that's what's pulling a lot of these immigrants out of um out of europe is that this promise of land you know um the, the great frontier even the artwork it, it you know even this this isn't as old as it looks this this poster um but it looks like that could be a you know set in the 1880s like that that sort of yeah. excitement and promise for for new and new uh, prosperity um and I, this uh, advertisement that ran clearly shows that 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 experience seamless yeah. from from uh, observation car up there on the right down to um, one of their ships. And what the hell? Can we jump back? Can we jump back to that last slide real quick, Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The this one. Um, the one with the posters well, on it, or the uh, the advertisement. I'm watching it live. I'm, I'm watching the live stream, so it's a bit of a uh, delay. Uh, the one with the wall of the poster yeah um can we just take a moment and observe just how golden that land is this is when they were trying to entice immigrants to come out and move to canada mm. and immigrate there and they were actually giving away farmland at dirt cheap prices if not free in order to get people to come out and and start building canada's agriculture and i just i notice that they literally painted the ground golden gold so really, yeah just it's that subliminal messaging going on here it looks warm and it looks like australia i that's i've had that exact view minus the train that exact view out my window right now wow <laughs> that's not that's that's a complete lie i live in i live in melbourne <laughs> yeah you're completely right that, <laughs> that yeah and and you know i, I was going to bring this up later on but just the name as well, Empress of Ireland, um, supposedly drew more Irish uh, passengers specifically to book on that ship because of the name traveling on the, the Empress of Ireland, which is yeah. which is uh, an interesting point. But we'll, we'll get onto that. I love this poster so much. Um, this mm -hmm. is about circa 1910. Um, the plan was paying off, you could say. It's, uh, yeah. it's That was an impressive time for them. So... Um, I think that some of the earliest liners were the, uh, the Empress of India, Japan, and China, the Empresses of India, Japan, and China, about 6,000 tons. 
Um, and this competition arose with the Allen line, which was driving this um, transatlantic race, you know, with, again, one of those great rivalries like White Star Cunard or Norddeutsche mm. Lloyd and um, Company Transatlantique. Um, just an interesting time for the company, and, and clearly they were just dominating uh, the ocean and, and the and the uh, railways. But then, what a fleet! What a fleet! I know it's it's absolutely <laughs> spectacular. Uh, come nineteen hundred and rolling into nineteen oh six, plans are now made for a pair of fairly large ships for for CPR. If we're thinking that they had just started, maybe. 15 years earlier with ships that were about 6,000 tons. Um, a pair of sister ships are planned, the Empress of Britain and the Empress of Ireland to be built at, at Fairfield. Big ships for their, for their time. Um, you, you said the other day that these are more, more like Lusitania than Titanic. They're more of Lusitania's generation, right? Yeah, they are. I was actually just about to ask you in, in terms of, tonnage and uh, and length what would you relate this ship the empress and, and her sister um what would you relate it to we're all far more familiar with the white star liners would she be yeah. about the size of the big four perhaps yeah well she, um, she wasn't particularly well, she was large for her, for her fleet right so she's 570 feet um and she has got gross register okay. tonnage of about fourteen thousand tons so that's obviously just enclosed passenger volume not right. total displacement, but um, what was uh, say Baltic would have been five hundred, six hundred feet, uh, something like that. A little less, probably a little more, probably. I don't know offhand. Yeah, but what's interesting about the the Empress, I guess, is she's got a fairly big beam for a ship of of her size, um, mm. and and a lot of internal volume. Um, She's got long promenades running the length of her decks, which aren't counted in her gross registered tonnage. So 14,000 tons of just passenger and, and internal volume, passenger space. Yeah, let, me, let me throw something out. And this is, I'm not going to be able to answer this. I, and I, I doubt you can, but... Me too. She, she was different. As you were just describing, she was wider than a lot of other ships her size. Um... She was designed to cross the Atlantic, I believe, in five or six days and going from Quebec City to England, five or six days. But the first two of those days are entirely spent in the St. Lawrence River. So I know that river boats tend to be a little wider than ocean going boats. So I'm wondering if there are actual riverboat features integrated into her overall design. That's a good point. The draft, I think, is a really good indicator of that, Tom, because she's very deep in the water. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, going into fresh water, there's less buoyancy because there is less salt. And the ship, I would imagine, as she's going along, heading towards um, Quebec City, would be sitting lower and lower in the water. And uh, I, th I think they, they accounted for that, absolutely. Um, but I th I th as well, there was a... Uh, there was this uh, drive to make ships more stable. The, the whole point of liners at that point was to trick people into thinking they were in a hotel. And you see that with obviously the Olympic class and the, the interior design, oh, yeah. but having a wider sure. ship um, to prevent that, that, that roll um, didn't totally work because <laughs> if, if Queen Mary and Queen yeah. Elizabeth rolled as much as they did, I'm sure this would have been like being in a, a, a tugboat. Yeah. <laughs> but um there was a really cool point here that, you know, uh, Tom, a lot of people say that, oh, you know, she wasn't as luxurious as um, Lusitania or, or Titanic, but I, she was very comfortable. This this uh, Grand Staircase, it, to me, just screams Art Nouveau. And and if you compare this to Baltics or any of the Big Four's Grand Staircases, the, the, the Grand Staircase from the Empress was, was beautiful. Yeah. She looks very much like a lot of the other ships that we are familiar with. This looks very Teutonic, um, yeah. or perhaps even Republic. Yeah. So, I think she was certainly on a similar playing field as the Lusitania, Mauritania, and um, if not the Olympic class, then the Big Four, for sure. Um, she was definitely on a, a close 
level to those if not quite there she might have been a little bit more of the budget option as opposed to the um you know the pristine lusitania but she's definitely an underrated liner if you're if you're traveling from um quebec to liverpool or vice versa you would probably elect to take one of these rather than say going to new york and then having to get a train up to um canada or up to up to quebec so that that oh. that, that it's kind of like the b line if the tra the major transatlantic trade is running england to new york and that's where you get these super liners and the the, the largest amount of um attention if you will if you consider that this is the b option the b route or the b route the, these ships yeah. are like the Titanics and the Lusitanias on their line, um, the Empress of Britain and the Empress of Ireland, for sure. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, the CPR did extend into the United States and actually still does. So I'm wondering if there was some sort of a connection down to um, down to New York. For example, there were so many Canadian passengers on board the Titanic heading off mm -hmm. to Montreal. So I, I think there was a CPR... Um, route going from new york or at least jersey city if yeah. not there was some sort of a syndicated partnership with uh one of the other lines perhaps the the reading or the yeah it was, it was the know. great era of um I, I know teddy roosevelt had just busted up a bunch of trusts but goodness like the, the conglomerations and you know like, like imm and the equivalent railway uh railway conglomerates can you guys did you just hear the iceberg dinging or I hope you guys can't hear that because I thought I muted it. I heard it. I, I didn't. Okay. Over, I, if over, you, over, if you guys hear iceberg digging, let me know because I, I did try to get rid of this. I, I don't want this to be derailed by uh, ridiculousness. I um, just got some photographs here of the interior of, um, of the Empress. Again, just showing how comfortable this is in first class. Apparently something like 46,000 square feet of mahogany, almost 50,000 square feet of mahogany we used in the construction which is Unbelievable. half of the forests in Canada in one ship. Um, and they made two of them. They made two of them. So Empress of Britain, suffice it to say. Okay, yeah, there's so many parallels here between, you know, the Olympic class, Lusitania and Mauritania, but obviously you need two big ships to operate a regular, reliable service. And as Cunard found, you really need, really need three. Yeah. So she was uh, extremely comfortable. Um, I... I uh, my favorite feature, I'd have to say, is probably that the music room, um, way up on the on the promenade deck there, where you've got that that really bizarre Art Nouveau. Uh, I don't even know what it is, but that that glass dome that then goes into a beam running up into the into the roof. You can kind of see it in this picture here. Yeah. Uh, they can, by the way, hear your uh, telegraph thing. That's frustrating because I, uh, I I see again. <laughs> Again, I I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be. Uh, These streams are so hard to work out. They're so finicky. There's no clear instructions online, so so don't 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 be hard on yourself. You guys should see my room right now because it, I look like a the pilot on a seven four seven. This is uh, <laughs> this is extreme. I don't know that I'm going to be able to turn it off right here and now. I'm sorry, guys. I I um, if you could all stop subscribing to me, that'd be that'd be great. Said no YouTuber ever. In fact, take it a step further and unsubscribe. <laughs> they'll, they'll actually do it. Um, no, don't do it. So yeah, if we're talking um, twenty knots, so I think she she at her sea trial she pipped um, nineteen. <laughs> Nick Nick Grone, I heard it. Nick Groner said I heard it and called the bridge immediately. That's very funny. Um, she uh, top speed of nineteen and a half, nineteen point six knots, and and a fairly short crossing then, like five or six days when. You know, even a hundred years earlier, it would have taken well over a month. If you were in that cabin yeah. for six days, you would be very comfortable. Oh, for sure. It's a beautiful liner. Just the the pictures you've been showing up there. The one that had the piano and a sort of a, a round room. Do you know what space on board that is? Yeah, I th I think that's the music room um, on the on the promenade deck. With that, I, I th again, I think this was all very heavily influenced by Art Nouveau, but that bizarre kind yeah. of. If you see it, it's not really as obvious in that photograph, but it, it was really this curving, weird glass pillar right in the middle of the room. Very cool. Yeah. Hmm. Um, 
even for for steerage as well that i wanted to get a photograph but i couldn't get one that was um that was free to put in the uh third class dying saloon was much nicer than than titanics in my opinion it would panel you know so even for third class this was a huge step up in in um quality of life Lusitane. yeah titanic's third class was much lower than you would anticipate looking at the other third class on other ships mm. um so it yeah anyway we're not here to talk about titanic but yes <laughs> she, the other ships of the era from the empress to cunard mm. did indeed have very nice third class accommodations i'd be comfortable in them yeah 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 i, I think i've stayed in them uh backpacking around around europe for a premium and they were far less comfortable <laughs> yeah <laughs> the equivalent yeah. yeah it's um photo photographs like this uh fascinating because how many people watching right now are descended of of these people you know it was such a such an important time in history for canada and the world you know so Very well interestingly Levi actually just texted me with a, a fun Empress fact um, that supposedly one out of 32 Canadians can trace their ancestry back to having immigrated on one of the two Empress ships. Wow, really? Goodness. Yeah, that's a little over 3%. Because when you think that, yeah, I mean, sh she was operating for over uh, almost 10 years of operation with her with her sister amazing yeah. so the 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 artwork on the posters it, it worked i mean that was you know there was clearly a, a promise for a better life so but the, these, these pictures are always, yeah yeah these pictures are always very uh, very touching especially when you consider yeah uh what what happened that that night um it's interesting that this has happened on a eastbound crossing so these are people mm. returning to uh to europe a lot of people i yeah. think i read somewhere correct me if i'm wrong that this this could have been people um people returning to europe and kind of anticipating that war was about to break out have you heard that uh no i i always hear about the exodus when war is about to break out mm -hmm. and um as opposed to going into into the fray it was i but like men often would the, the fathers of the family would go ahead of their wives and children to establish themselves and then sail the women and children out uh, yeah. once they had successfully found work. And I'm just wondering if a, a lot of these men would, or people were returning to their families. Um, well, yeah. they could be going to pick them up to help immigrate them back, but it also wasn't all that uncommon mm. for immigrants who moved over to the United States and Canada who actually thoroughly succeeded in establishing a better quality of life and after only a, a few years, maybe a decade, actually have the funds to return to Europe and visit their families. There's a lot of instances of them never seeing their families again, but there's a fair percentage of them that did actually do so well in the new world that they were able to just take a, a month and, and return to their homeland and see their parents, see their siblings their cousins and just visit their old town so i think um you're going to be seeing a lot of that especially yeah. in the steerage on uh, on eastbound voyages that's fascinating i mean my you know we we emigrated to australia my family in, in the late 50s and um my grandfather never saw his his brothers or sisters again he was one of like six and that was it they, they wrote to each other twice or two or three times via telegram like airmail and I've got yeah. those letters. That was the last contact they ever had. It's just, um, it, was, it was really was a different generation. Yeah, you know, very different time. It's heartbreaking. It is very heartbreaking. I mean, they called some of the piers where immigrants would board and 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 leave for the new world. They called them heartbreak heartbreak piers. Mm. I think. So yeah. it's um, it's tragic. I mean, you can see why. just just leaving your family and friends behind, and it's even more tragic when you don't even make it and you get torpedoed or strike an iceberg or collide with another ship and go down it's taking your life and your future into your own hands and the future of your family and that's a yeah. massive burden yeah very well said I, I often think about how unqualified every person 
what every passenger on a liner was when confronted with danger at sea like how unfamiliar that situation would be to them i think now most of us can swim nowadays but at that time this this was another world this you may have been on a may as well have been on an airplane or a spaceship i mean this was just the final frontier yeah. as far as they were concerned so as soon as something goes wrong it's uh it's unthinkable um so the picture i've got up here I, i'm fairly certain this is one of the the last photographs of the empress ever taken this is very late in her career because she's got the black uh, funnel topping so the, May 1914, the Empress uh, is turned over to this chap, um, Captain Henry George Kendall. Um, he's from Chelsea in the UK. I think he's about 40, maybe 41. Um, this is interesting. He was wrecked on the Lusitania, but not that Lusitania. Uh, when he was about 14 or 15, a, a ship that he was serving on called Lusitania was sunk and he survived the shipwreck, which is yeah. an odd echo of, uh, of th things to come or echo of history um he'd worked with guglielmo marconi on developing ship to shore wireless um, but most importantly and maybe one of the things he's most renowned for is for apprehending this guy here um whose name is dr hawley harvey crippen and was a mm -hmm. fugitive murderer and if you were a fugitive murderer and your name was hawley harvey crippen and you were a doctor that's exactly what you'd look like in 1906 yep. um i think um Kendall was captain on the Montrose, oh, sorry, 1908 or 1909, and recognized Crippen um, and shot a telegram f a forward uh, before before leaving, saying, uh, "Have a strong suspicion that uh, Crippen is on board." And um, he was arrested at the next at the next port of call. And it, Kendall got some uh, some fame for that one, which is interesting. But then That's in May sure. May 1914, uh, he is appointed captain of the Empress of Ireland. And this would be his first uh, voyage, his first crossing on the on the ship, which is ominous. And and supposedly, uh, my my good friend uh, Nick Hache, who lives fairly near to where the Emperor sank, he he sent this through to me and and has you know and insinuated that this is the last photograph taken of the Empress, twenty eighth of May, nineteen fourteen. She goes. So she's about. Um, two thirds full with passengers. Uh, you've got 253 in second class, only 87 in first, uh, and 717 in, in third class. And then as the, as she's pulling away from the quay, the Salvation Army band is sending about 170 people to, to England for a conference. And they play, if, if, if you want to have a bit of a cry, look up the song, um, God be with you till we meet again. Uh, because I was playing it last night and I got surprisingly emotional, um, then they play that as the ship pull away from the key. <clears throat> so, um, probably worth saying as well, by the way, that this is again, a very grim story. So I, I know a lot of kids watch this channel. So I just wanted to give a heads up that this is a fairly sad at times macabre story. I don't want to get too voyeuristic, but, um, it was a very violent disaster. Yeah, it was. I was. I was. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So, Quebec City's down here at the real narrows of the, of the river, I believe. Um. Yes. The route up into the Gulf, of Saint Lawrence. If she's departing from about here, you said it, it took about two days thereabouts to to clear this this whole river and estuary mm -hmm. i don't know where the end of that two days is i don't know if that's open atlantic or just the end of the saint lawrence river and entering into the gulf of saint lawrence but from what i understand the first two days of the five or six day voyage was um was the uh just the river just the lawrence yeah yeah i mean it's interesting here as well that this wasn't just a straight voyage out. There were a number of stops that she had to do. She had to pick up a pilot um, mm -hmm. at Pinto Pair, uh, and then she had to pick up mail as well, um, customs officials, and she would stop. And I believe one of her last last stops would have just been off um, Ramuski, where she met met with a boat that would have carried. Uh, I think it was even even um, CPR. This is interesting. CPR ticketing agents who would meet. 
the passengers to arrange for their transportation by rail to their final destinations um which is an interesting uh interesting one but she she left at about 4 30 p.m that night and by the early hours of of the next morning so about 1 30 she's around uh around here somewhere around Ramuski. i think Ramuski is about there where uh here where my mouse pointer is now i don't think we see your mouse i realized that i was putting the mouse on my uh on my streamlabs obs software yes. this is <laughs> all right <laughs> I'm, I'm figuring Wait, it out as I go. can we see it if we squint there we go there's your mouse <laughs> or well I, again I'm, I'm watching the delay so people are seeing i know people are in. But, uh, but yeah, now you're beginning to see my green screen. This this went so much smoother last time. I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to s sort this out. But of course, one of the bizarre natural phenomena of uh, of the area is that it gets extremely uh, foggy, and I think it's it's famous for its fog. Like it could it could out of nowhere you could just suddenly have a, a like a, a soup, you know. And speaking of, and speaking of, guess what happened now? That night. So heading in the opposite direction, heading towards Quebec, was uh, the ship captained by the most jolly looking fellow in human history, Thomas Anderson. Um, she was a Norwegian collier. Look how much of the ship is underwater. Look how deep the draft is there. Yeah. Pretty standard. Very well. Yeah. She, she, very standard for her time. Like she's a classic. Uh, collier of the era but there she had one oh, yeah bizarre design uh design spe specific point that she was made with this thing called the uh she had longitudinal frames designed for basically belting through ice flows not something you want to maybe collide with right no she was uh, quite fortified practically a rammer if you think about it and those Coal ships, cargo ships in general back then had a very, um, very deep draft. So this is going to be coming at anything with a, with tons and tons of momentum behind it. Yeah. And as you said, this is, this is the worst thing to have pointed at you. Yeah. And if, if you were to think about ships that you would yeah, definitely not want to be colliding with, I think this is it. I think she's loaded down with, she would typically be carrying coal. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and steel and ore, um, a very heavy ship moving at even even a, a slow speed. If, if it would hit anything, it would just be an immense impact. Um, the issue with longitudinal framing um, principle, where she's got frames instead of just running across like a, a slice of bread, they're also running the full length of the length of the ship. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, fully fortified. Um, Interesting point. Thomas Anderson traveling with his crew and as well his wife Anna was on board, which I thought was a was an interesting point. Um, so they spot each other um, off uh, having having passed Rubisky, and that's where the story kind of gets confusing because both ships claim that they stopped or they decided to you know stay well clear of each other. Um, but it, yeah, Kendall. Kendall said, Kendall changed the stories a couple of times, and actually Anderson remained pretty consistent from start to finish. Kendall initially was claiming that. All right, well, let me back it up a little bit. They were they were coming at each other, and I believe they were starboard to starboard and planning to pass, and then the fog rolled in. It swept over the Storstad first. And then about a minute later, it, it swept over the Empress. Um, Kendall claimed that at that point, after having changed course a couple of times, which he should never do in the fog, mm. after having changed course a couple of times, he claims he stopped. And then the Storstadt came in out of nowhere and rammed him from the side and somehow defying physics, pivoted on its own momentum around. Um, whereas the Storstad claimed it was just going straight. And then I, I believe, see, this is, again, we're not historians. I believe it tried turning starboard because it thought the Empress was going to cross 
go across it because it saw it change course at the last moment. So it tried to go right and then ended up ramming right into the side. Um, but they they contradicted each other, mm. uh, polar opposites of what they were saying. In fact, one reporter wrote that if if their testimonies, if both testimonies are to be believed, the two ships collided with each other while they were completely stopped and two miles apart. So uh, right. essentially, essentially making a, a jab at the fact that According to their testimonies, they should, they never even hit each other. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really good point. I mean, the, as soon as the St. Lawrence gets foggy, you know, it's, it's lights out for, for however long and, and nature takes over. Right. And it's interesting yeah. that the fog came up just after the ship spotted each other. And there still seems to be this kind of cloud of fog over the, 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 the whole story, but you're absolutely dead. Right. But two points off of that is that the Empress should not have stopped because common practice was to maintain heading and course and speed while sounding your, your foghorn and to close the watertight mm -hmm. doors um, in case of an emergency. But Kendall did not close the watertight yeah. doors, I believe, and stopped. So in the, the chain of events that led to this disaster happening, that's already a, that's already a, a, you know, a big one, a big factor here. But it has to be said that the Empress did not ram sideways onto the Storstadt's bow. The Storstadt had to have hit her. So Exactly. Yeah, she did. It's it's uh it's confusing. Um there's a great book I was actually gonna recommend if anyone can pick it up as I do like to plug on my streams. Fourteen minutes. Um by James Crowell it gives a very interesting detailed kind of breakdown of the uh of, of the the sequence of events and how it you know both accounts kind of conflict but what happened was the result was a, a fairly okay. intense impact so if we look at this this broadside starboard view of the empress that you'll see in a second there tom um what i've done is i've just marked out in blue the amount of ship under the waterline yeah um in this picture that's about to come up green represents the the engine room the red are the, the critical water type bulkheads uh, and the yellow are the boilers and mm -hmm. the orange wedge is roughly the impact point of the Storstadt's bow plunging dead amidships i often think that in a lot of um in a lot of shipping disasters that are quite famous you can say well at least you know with titanic she took a long time to sink at least a lot of people could get off at least it was a flat calm um, with the Lusitania, or at least it was in the middle of the day, at least it was close to land. There, there are not a lot of, well, at least with the Empress, because every possible worst case scenario happened, except for it maybe happening in a storm. You know, it was at night, at the, the first night of the voyage, so passengers had no idea about the ship. They hadn't familiarized themselves with the ship yet. And it, she gets rammed by a ship almost designed for ramming things um, mm -hmm. in the most critical point. Of her of her construction that that critical bulkhead between the, the sure. boiler rooms yeah the um as you said this was the worst case scenario come true everything that could go wrong i know this is trite but everything that could go wrong did go wrong and it it was a nightmare an absolute nightmare that unfolded um mm. levi actually just popped into the chat and uh brought up something interesting he says the empress of britain just a few years prior in fog ran and sank a ship just a mile or two from where the empress sank and the captain was blamed for going too fast and this was very likely to be on kendall's mind at the time great point levi very interesting yeah. that's very yeah, interesting. thank you yeah the psychology behind that obviously you would want to uh I, you know, I mean, at its widest point, I think it's 70 kilometers across, which is maybe like 50 miles. And that's at its, at its widest point. And there's a lot of traffic there. So you'd, you'd want to play it safe, I guess. Yeah. Now, one thing that I'm, I'm hazy on, I'm sure it's known. I just, I don't know it, is um, where the order stands with the watertight doors. Captain Kendall claims he closed the watertight doors, or at least ordered that the watertight doors be closed. 
Mm. But they were diving into it and they found no indication that he actually sent that order. Now, there were a lot of crew who did go throughout the ship in the first few minutes of the sinking to try to manually close the watertight door. Now, I don't know if that is because he ordered it and they were responding to the orders or when the ship is going down, it's just common sense. Run and close as many watertight doors as you can if that's a responsibility you're trained in. So do you happen to know that? Do you know if he actually truly gave that order? Uh, in the book, 14 minutes, it insinuates that he gave the order after the impact um, when the ship had already taken on a list. And and I, to your point, Tom, I think maybe how much of that order was necessary versus how much was, was crew yeah. understanding that unlike um, maybe what we're familiar with, switch-operated doors that close vertically, these are manually wound cranked doors similar to what you might find on titanic's uh scotland road um and they close very they close horizontally very, yeah yeah that's a lot of cranking and it's and it's not easy there's a lot of resistance to that cranking it's exhausting i think it's usually a two-man team that goes down and does it yeah. and um there's a lot of doors to close even in a ship the size of the empress yeah, Kiwi Sentinel, Sentinel in the chat says watertight doors below the waterline are operated from the bridge, but above are manual. So all throughout the sinking, you see stories of men rushing around trying to close these doors, struggling against now a listing ship that they can't get the doors closed uh, because they're going against the list of the ship and you've got tons of door. Um, so again, like worst, worst possible scenario. Yeah, for sure. So I just wanted to pause for a minute and just spare a thought for the guys on shift in the boiler room where this impact occurred because yeah where they're it's not like you know you've you've got plates separated and now water is seeping in it you've got this which is about six or seven stories tall coming straight through the hull of the ship and where there was once hull of ship there is no longer hull and as the ships obviously separate the ocean isn't just trickling in you've now got tons of water just slamming in into the boiler room. I mean, those guys had no chance. It's really tragic. And I think uh, one or two decks above from the boiler rooms, you've got second class um, accommodations, second class cabins that were obviously uh, impacted directly by the impact. Um, and unfortunately, they, they did find, I think, trace amounts of, of, say, human remains on the bow of the shore start because these people who were sleeping in that, in that vicinity would have just immediately immediately been killed so it's a, a very very gruesome very violent impact um i think there was a yeah. newspaper that said it was something like the equivalent of uh where was this 240 freight cars hitting wall at 20 miles an hour and so a very high energy uh, impact so this is the immediate result this is a great painting by uh the artist eve berube uh you see this a lot uh, when the Empress is brought up, but it's a brilliant depiction. Um, and that, that immediate list, maybe a, about a, a five degree list immediately as the two ships are, are separated. Hey, can I address something real quick? And I see in the chat that's relevant to what we were just talking about. Yeah. Orion Taylor says that you would need to find the bridge engine telegraph in order to be able to tell for certain um, if the order to close the watertight doors was given. Now, they actually did a specific um expedition into the wreck to find that telegraph and no the indication shows that that order was not transmitted through the go on okay um the indication was that no that order was not transmitted through the telegraph now i don't know if the empress had any other means of indicating that the watertight doors need to close so maybe there's another chance that he did give that order at the very least vocally or, or yeah. verbally but no, the, as, as you were saying, you do have to find that telegraph, and they did. And that indication for closing the watertight doors is not there. That's very interesting. I know the engine order telegraph shows full speed ahead. So it seems to me that he was yeah. immediately trying to get out of the way. And maybe in a panic, he's just not, he's not done it. That's, that's a really good point. I saw a photograph of that telegraph. Mm. And um, the... You know how there's two different indicators on it. One is the from the bridge and one is the response from the engineer. One was in stop position. One was in full ahead. 
which means there was a change going on when the engine room got flooded out and, and the engineers had to abandon their posts. Um, unfortunately, I forget which one was which, so I can't speak to that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that information is out there and it is findable. Yeah. If um, anybody wants to take that a little bit further. I know I do, but I, I, don't, I haven't had time. Yeah, but well, it's, it's fortunate. It's, I just I looked at that photograph yesterday. I was going to put it in the presentation, and the the order down was full ahead. And I'm wondering here if Kendall realized we're close to shore. Let's beach the ship, mm -hmm. and has put the order to full ahead. But as you say, that within five minutes or nine minutes, the engine room is flooded and the ship is plunged into darkness, and the lights go out. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, when we're talking about worst case scenario, um, you've got people who aren't familiar with ships, probably who, at this their first night on board, they have no idea where they are, and it's now pitch black. And probably the most disorienting and horrifying thing here is that as the list worsens, um, stairways and rooms and things are pitched onto their side, and you can't get out. Because when you think, yeah. we talked earlier that the ship is quite wide, it's about 60 or 70 feet, which is fine when that's on a, on a horizontal plane. But if you now think that the door out that you need to get to the boat deck is now at least three or four stories above your head, um, the, the further it goes. I, and I, you're I, in darkness. And you're in darkness. Um, I try and to... you have however many people around you clamoring and panicking, grabbing at your feet, trying to pull themselves up. It's... Yeah. Yeah. Absolute, absolute chaos. I, I'm, of course, on the outboard side to the impact. Um, you know, lifeboats now swing inward when they're struggling to lower these. These are radial davit lifeboats as well, right? These aren't well in davits where you can crank them out. This this is a lot of yeah. a traditional seamen style operation of of machinery and and old school davits that takes a long time and a lot of work. They didn't have it. It's amazing they were able to get boats away. Um, after this impact i wanted to touch on this real quick as well i think this is a, a disaster that you're quite interested as well tom but just clue us in on the on the eastland real quick because i've got some photographs from the interior that i wanted to to explain sure sure the eastland was an american steamer um i don't know what you would class her as she certainly wasn't an ocean liner she was built for the great lakes um, and in 1915, I believe it was, she was chartered among four or five ships to take an entire telephone company, their, their entire staff, out for a, a daily picnic. Um, they were going to leave Chicago, they were heading over to Michigan City, and they were all boarding the Eastland and several other boats. One was the Roosevelt, I think, I forget the others. And um, unfortunately, these ships were very top-heavy, made even more so by the additional lifeboats that were required by American law as a result of the Titanic sinking. So over the course of the morning, I think like 8 or 9 a.m., hundreds and hundreds of people were boarding the Eastland, and it just started to list back and forth and it began to rock and then it went over a little too far in one direction water started to flood in and then it just went on its side i think it killed something like 800 people it was a terrible tragedy and it was completely completely forgotten i'd say um because how many people outside of our ocean line liner circle truly know about it mm. there's um so yeah, that was it, and uh, you've got a photo of it right there. The ship was recovered eventually, and but for the next week or so, they were still pulling bodies out of it, and the ship laid on its side. Yeah, and to give some impression, thanks for that, Tom. That was, that was very concisely and brilliantly explained. I've got some photographs here of the interior of the ship yeah. to give some indication of how disorienting uh, a ship can be when it is rolling or at least on its side yeah that is a nightmare like, really... yeah navigating that in darkness uh trying to get out i mean this this it's amazing to think that so many lost their lives at the wharf in chicago um this 
happening mid ocean. It's 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 almost impossible to uh, to imagine. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. Very disorienting. Yeah, it is. So at some point, there's some kind of um, some kind of explosion and steam pouring out of the ship. Again, I think this all happens within 14 minutes. We've been speaking an hour now, so the Empress could have sunk well, like four times at least. I, what I love about this this painting is you can see people clambering out over the the masts and the the um, the cargo handling derricks which we've got accounts of like engineers and people crawling like flies across surfaces as they become more and more horizontal, um, which is just... The ship is floating away now. Yeah. Yeah. So she's in pit pitch black. Um, this was an interesting one. The Marconi operator um, in, in sending out his final message because he could tell the spark was dying. And I know you'll love this point because you're fascinated by the Marconi. Um, on the final dot in his yes answer to the nearest, uh, I think it was Point Opair that was a wireless operator, he held down the key so that hey, they could hear the tone getting dimmer and dimmer as the power died. That's rather, chilling. Yeah, rather than saying, hey, come get us, we are sinking over and over, he just held that down so that that one operator could just tell straight away, He, as an operator, he would know that oh, this is serious because they're losing power. And there's only one reason why that would be happening. Um, you said Levi was sending you little facts and things. He he basically gave me an entire uh, fact sheet. So the, all all um, you know, co uh, credit to him for a lot of these points. But um, you said earlier, Tom, that a lot of this human drama was playing out. That there were little moments, you know, um, a steward offering his life belt to a passenger and asking, "Are you married?" And she says, "Yes." And he says, "You're going to need this more than I will." Um, a Salvation Army band member giving his life belt to a woman who then um, falls as the ship heals. She she disappears into the into the night. It, it, tragic stories, but they are they are playing out. Yeah, everybody everybody had that one little moment. I'm sure during the sinking, it rolled onto its side um, relatively quickly in the sinking, maybe around the halfway point, I think, and it sat like that for quite some time. And I remember um, the first time I really started paying attention to the Empress, if you will, or at least giving it serious thought, it was actually the first time I was on the Queen Mary. Mm. And I, um, coincidentally, while I was sitting there, was talking with a friend. Actually, um, the picture I see live right now, if that's the one you're holding where it's on its side and... Just, just hold there for a moment. I was talking with a friend of mine on the Queen Mary about the Empress and um, how when it sat on its side, some people were opening their windows and trying to get out. But with two exceptions, nobody could actually fit through those windows and escape. Um, so they might have their head poking out, and I apologize if this is very morbid, but they, they were able to climb halfway out. Um but they just couldn't get out. And then the ship, when it did go under, just brought them down with it. And uh, when they dived the wreck in the subsequent weeks to recover what they could, they were still halfway out the portholes. And I stayed on the Queen Mary that night in, the, in you know one of the vintage cabins. And I was very conscious the in the entire night of that steel hull a foot away from me and it, it the ship felt like a tomb that night to be honest with you because i was visualizing the empress quite a bit wow yeah levi sent me a the story of a fellow named dr grant who was asleep and then managed to squeeze he, he was one of the guys who managed to squeeze through but he, his his hips and arms were lacerated by the by the effort i mean when you think that some of these portholes are only nine inches in total diameter um, that's, uh, yeah, yeah that's, they, what can you say? It's, it's just tragic. They, they had minutes to make these decisions, snap decisions. Do I, you know, what, what do I do? And then to be in, in that sort of, uh, in that situation, that's horrible. Terrifying. Supposedly, uh, so, and again, in one of those, um, worst case scenario, things coming true, the, the water at this point is somewhere around 34 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about two to seven degrees Celsius. Um, so not much more than Titanic. No. So 
you know, when you hear a story of a passenger from California swimming five miles to shore, you have to be, uh, you have to be impressed. Yeah. One of the most dramatic well, moments. Oh, sorry, mate. Go ahead. Uh, when I first read about that, so little backstory, there was a passenger on the Empress who was from California and he swam five miles and pulled himself ashore and survived. Um, which is remarkable. That's farther than anyone else swam in the sinking. But um, I kind of questioned something there. Yeah. Because Cal California at that time had a statewide contest where you hundreds of people swam from Los Angeles to Catalina Island which is 25 miles out, yeah. which to me sounds like a death race because uh, those seas are rough. And I can't imagine just swimming out. But I, it just kind of pulls on that thought in my mind. Like maybe, maybe he did that. Maybe there's a little bit of backstory there that we have no record of. And mm. the fact that he's mentioned to be from California gives a little bit of credence to that. That's, a, that's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, and, and um, it's interesting as well that we know that Storstad was standing too uh, and organizing boats now. That they were lowering their own boats to try and retrieve passengers. And yeah. Probably the most dramatic moment of the night, in my opinion, is when the, the captain of the Empress, Kendall, boards the Storstad and confronts Captain Anderson and says something to the effect of, you've sunk my ship. The, the emotions at play between these two uh characters in that in that moment that is a uh you, you if you were to write that in fiction someone would accuse you of being uh overly dramatic but it it, it happened which is fascinating yeah i think very heavy-handed moment yeah you were you were talking earlier that the fairly early on the, sh the relatively that the ship had rolled totally but when you and having stayed on Queen Mary as well, uh, you would. I haven't, so I'm speaking about you here. I'm too far away. But the the amount of equipment and things on the Queen Mary that you you double the amount, and then you've kind of got some understanding of what's on the Empress. We've got winches and and davits and all these things that aren't designed really to hold to the deck of a ship if it's past a certain point because they're so insanely heavy. Um, and so you have things falling. Uh, Derek masts, cargo booms, and winches, and things that weigh tons and tons and tons. And uh, you have, I think, stories of lifeboats being um, decimated by things, maybe even a funnel at, at one point, potentially. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was saying this the other the other day in our, in our last call, that there's a lot of stories with the Lusitania sinking such as a lifeboat pancaking down on top of another or a funnel falling and taking out a lifeboat. And there's actually reason to question if those incidents actually did occur on board the Lusitania. But those stories did happen on the Empress. That's just how horrifying it was that night. Mm. As, as we've said already a couple of times, what could go wrong did go wrong. It was an utter nightmare. And, and when you think of... I visualize the, the three biggest sinkings of ocean liners of that era to be the Titanic, the Lusitania, and the Empress. I think we can all agree those are the top three. And without a doubt, the most horrifying of the three is the Empress. And mm. unfortunately, it's also the most forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, there's a, there was one more that I think of um, that I think occurred well before uh, any of the, I think maybe in 1906 off the top of my head, um, the Principe de Asturias. I think oh, yeah. Spanish. And, and again, if we're talking about things going totally wrong, uh, that happening in, in, again, like pitch black in the middle of a storm. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, and again, when you think these people have got no qualification to be in that situation, like how alien this is, when you see these people here in this picture, when you think that they're, they're clerks and farmers and Salvation Army band members and are standing 
on the side of an overturned ship in pitch black in freezing water. I, 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 I don't think we're any more qualified to survive that situation now, you know, let alone back then. Even the crew, even the crew at the time, the average deck crew or engineer has minimal to no uh, sinking ship training or even experience unless you've actually really been there before. So some of the officers might have training in theory as to what to do during a sinking ship, but for those who have never experienced it prior, unlike Captain Kennel, who was on the other Lusitania when she went down, you don't know what to do, and you're really just hoping that you remember all of your training, And but even then, you sinking ships are such a random occurrence where, yeah, you could train for what you should do. Yeah, I'm, all right. Take the Empress, for example. Train. Swing the boats out as soon as possible. Get the watertight doors closed as soon as possible. Send out the call for help. You know, the, oh, fire rockets if you have to. That kind of thing. You can do any of those yeah. on the Empress, at least not reliably. The SOSs died very quickly. Fortunately, they were able to get them out. The watertight doors, a lot of the crew went to close them. But they flooded out before they could even get them shut swing the lifeboats out. Now, they did get a good number of boats away from the Empress, but one whole side of the boat was next to impossible to launch from after mm -hmm. the first three minutes. So, even if you're trained, the book does not actually... The book that they train from does not actually accommodate a true sinking ship. Yeah. So, even the crew and her officers were far out of their comfort zones, and it's terror for everybody. Yeah, yeah, great point. I, I, I think still a listing ship presents problems for a crew. We saw it with the Costa Concordia that at some point, I mean, they were having trouble getting the boats back towards the ship to load passengers. I think I saw one uh, dancer from the entertaining troupe formed a human bridge out of himself by holding on so people could scramble on board. I, you know, it it's one of those things that you, you're absolutely right. It's so random that you can't really plan for it because it's really one in a one in a million the odds of this happening is so insanely low especially now and um, yeah but it does happen and when it does uh this is the result yeah. so uh the the empress sank bow first um and so the stern came up a little and, and she was gone sometime around maybe 2 10 in the morning um leaving a quite a few people treading water uh those that couldn't get out of the ship and were clinging onto the side um again i mean it was uh freezing cold there was a stoker who had been on the titanic william clark and um, who then I, I actually i don't know if he survived this this disaster i don't know if anyone's familiar with william clark uh, but if you want to have a quick google and let us know if he survived or died drop it in the chat drop it in the chat um so many tragic numbers but you know 31 percent of uh people were saved of 138 children four were saved and of those 170 odd uh, Salvation Army band members, 159 were lost, which is devastating for a community like that. Yeah. Which again brings, so, so the Salvation Army was sending over band members, as you had mentioned, but um, that also rings some of the same tones from the Eastland, because that was a company outing. The um, one of the telephone companies, I used to know the name of it, but for the Salvation Army band, that was devastating. And for the same telephone company that lost the Eastland, th the picnic was canceled and it was canceled. I think the next year too, for obvious reasons, but it's, it's like losing a family member still yeah. when you're that tight of a community. Yeah. So it's, to lose hundreds very hard to recover from emotionally yeah you think of um it reminds me a little of the first world war where you had i think they called them friends battalions or friendship battalions as part of a recruitment drive where if you're all from the same town you could all enlist and fight together rather than being randomly assigned to a different battalion but of course Bad idea. all the uh all the losses were then concentrated in one town. So if that battalion gets decimated, that's that entire village's people in the UK have just been wiped out. Uh, it's like the Sullivan brothers in World War II. Mm. Uh, the, the basis for the film Saving Private Ryan? 
I think so. No, I no the the basis for Saving Private Ryan was a different family okay. because they actually talk about the Sullivan brothers in in Ryan. They now we're now we're getting off topic, but they they created a rule that brothers were not allowed to serve in the same units mm. because of the Sullivans, which were four brothers who served on a ship in the U.S. Navy, sank, all four of them were killed. Wow. Um, and because of the devastation that that does to the rest of the family, they were um, they passed that rule where families had to be split up. But with Saving Private Ryan, mm. they were split up, but still three brothers were yeah, killed five. within among each other. That part of the film, I think, is true. Everything beyond that is fiction. Yeah, you, you can't concentrate losses. And then, of course, when you think about then with the Empress, you've got migrant families. You saw Titanic, I think, the, the Godwin family, um, where I think a family of thir 13. Well, it, yeah. Yeah, huge. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's really hard to to see. Uh, these these period illustrations are fascinating because they're so good. Um, and they really... Oh, yeah. That, that may as well be a photograph, that, that, that picture right there. That really... Uh, that one tells the story really well. It does. So that's um, that's the the first part of the the chat kind of um, kind of behind us now. That's the the story, the abbreviated story. I'd I'd love to talk about the inquiries and, and what happened next, but that's almost like its own video. Um, <laughs> but in in summary, the, the the local inquiry finds the empress completely free of blame, and it was all the Storstadt's fault. Naturally. And then a second inquiry is held, I think, in Norway, who finds the Storstadt completely f free of blame. And it was the Empress's fault. Naturally. But then the First World War breaks out and it's, you know, I, I think this was a shock to, to the world, but it was almost like a curiosity. And then and then the kind of world events overtook her. And, uh, and she wasn't really i mean she was she was salvaged a lot of the wreck was was um immediately afterwards bodies were being retrieved you know silver bullion and and you know precious metal is pulled out of it but then she's left untouched until the 1960s almost um which is fascinating it just shows that the the it had, in the collective memory it had really dropped off mm -hmm. um forgot people got distracted very quickly yeah by world events yeah and and what events you know is momentous so what I wanted to do real quick, um, I think Chelsea has been uh, collecting um, comments and things. So what I, I was yeah. just going to flick over, uh, and we can answer a couple of these uh, and just address some of these. Um, if you added air conditioning, this is from uh, Sir Liv. If you added air conditioning, do you think there could be a market for a ship like Empress of Ireland today? Same accommodations, um, maybe a shorter, shorter route. Uh, so we're, we're talking really about a uh, modern retro vintage style cruise ship that's fully decked out like a Edwardian ocean liner on the interior. Yeah, which I am I, all for. <laughs> so am I, and so is everybody in the chat here. But um, not the vast majority of paying customers, unfortunately. Mm. I would be all for it. You'd be all for it, as you said, but. You know, we would be able to afford one voyage each yeah. after saving up for quite some time. And then uh, then what? Now you got to market it to the rest of the world's population who wants their TVs and their onboard casino and their rock climbing walls and their heated swimming pools and jacuzzis. One thing we take so, for granted is personal space on ships like this. I think that someone can yeah. this. Yeah, the Titanic's... Uh, meters squared per passenger against the queen mary twos and queen mary twos is four or five times that of of a ship yeah. of titanic zero. It's... and titanic had far more than the empress yeah titanic was spacious yeah all things considered one of the most spacious ships on the seas at the time mm. so yeah uh, personal space is a huge thing i definitely want my personal space and i think we all would um the empress of Ireland was built for a society mm. that no longer exists. Yeah. It, 
it would not work. It would. It's fun to fantasize about. I would love it for sure. But I think it's it's doable in an adapted way. But there's also no reason to people. Even the Titanic two, and everybody loves the Titanic. But Titanic two is the most promising of all replica ocean liners to ever be undertaken, and even that's just spinning its wheels. So and I don't scenery. think. <laughs> An, an onboard casino, because I have to say I agree yeah. with with the changes they were making to the Titanic too. You have yeah. to you have to do some of that. And mm -hmm. interestingly, um, descendants of Bruce Ismay also agreed. Um, gave some very interesting insight on that mm -hmm. um, when I was talking to to one of them. Oh, okay. if if these. Now, again, we're derailing with Titanic 2. So they're adding a casino. They're adding a bunch of, you know, I don't know what else was mentioned. But if those amenities were popular in 1912, you can be darn sure that Bruce Ismay would have added them to the Titanic as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, you, to your point, 100%. The, the society doesn't exist anymore. Right? The, the, when you think of the yeah. entertainment options on offer... Uh, a three-legged race, yeah. um, quoits, shuffleboard, yeah. rigging, and walking. And a piano. Don't forget the piano. And the piano. Um, you know, people need that instant gratification. So, yeah, it's 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 an interesting point. I would love to... I, I, I think there would be room for a cruise ship that the interior is so out there and so old-fashioned and art nouveau. We've kind of seen it a little bit with... The Queen Elizabeth, the, the modern cruise ship, but take it to the next level. I think people would kind of go out of their way to experience this otherworldly, maybe almost like the Disney, um, the Disney ships, you know, where it's so such an experience. It's like yeah. being on a floating theme park. But I could see a, uh, an ocean liner replica that's an amalgamation of all sorts of ships of the era. Mm. You know, where we're seeing hold from Cunard, from CPR, from White Star, from even Hamburg America and the French lines. I could easily see something like that working mm -hmm. if it's built around the modern day cruise ship model. Yeah. 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 Absolutely agreed. Um, anyway. D Ryan Meister said that, uh, one man, John Lee mean... did get through a, uh, a porthole and lived, he was wearing his pajamas, of course, and this, this on, on display or were on display in, uh, Quebec and Halifax. Which is uh, which is fascinating. There was a, a Levi told me this as well. There was a set of antlers because um, one one chap had been hunting. Was it Stetton yes. Carr? Yeah, had been hunting and, and killed a bull moose, and uh, the the antlers were on board, and they were recovered and are currently on display. Apparently, that's incredible. Which is he incredible. lost his trophy, and now someone else is displaying it. Yeah, right. Um, Andrew Brendan has a really good point. Um, after the Titanic sank, CPR had a rule that crew members had to know the ship so well that they could get out onto the open deck even in complete darkness. Good policy. Good oh, policy. That's a very good policy. And yeah. um, I think we saw it in action that night because the crew uh, got lifeboats away within, at least within 10 minutes because the, the, um, the list got too severe, even within five minutes. So they, I don't mm -hmm. know exactly how many boats they got away versus how many floated off the ship, but they, they, if they lowered more than one or two, I'm impressed because you know how much effort went into, say, on the night of Titanic. It took an yeah. hour to get the boats ready. There was, well, there was a lot of dawdling on the Titanic yeah. for the deckhands. That I'm not, I'm not saying the captain and the officers, but there was quite a bit of dawdling with uh, with getting the boats prepped. It does take time for sure, but. I think if if they knew the urgency, mm. they would have been yeah. a little faster. But yeah, good point. But even even th these being radial davits, I, th I think I mentioned it earlier. But the, if you look up how radial davits are uh, operated, and when you think how much time goes into actually swinging these things out, it's it's uh, I, I'm amazed. So I, I think the training actually really came into effect that night because I can see this going if they had not had that uh, degree of training. I can see this going a very different direction, and no boats getting away mm -hmm. and just floating off, you know? Um, so Liv uh, mentions a story of a passenger right at the point of impact that had his bed, sorry, had her bed pushed across the room by the bow of the Storstad, but she survived. 
unbelievable. Really unbelievable. Um, wow. So yeah, look, keep those questions and things coming. We're going to, uh, how are we going for time? We're actually at the hour and a half mark right now. So we are way over time, but that's because we, we just like talking, talking ships. Do you have 15, 20 minutes to run through our, uh, our next part of the presentation? Are you asking me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm going to want dinner at some point, but I could do it. Yeah, sure. I'm enjoying it. I like talking to you, Mike. I, you, you know what? You're all right. I, I, think, I, think, we get along. I think we get along just fine. Thank you. Um, I think so. Let's talk about artifacts, because you've got a couple of, of little things. I've got a couple of little things. I just wanted to roll through these real quick. Um, okay. Nice spoon. Well, that's my spoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, while you while you get it, I'll just. I thought you were going to go first. I didn't pull my. No, no, go ahead. I'll give a quick preamble because there are a number of very famous divers who have uh, salvaged pieces from the Empress of Ireland. I think Bart Bart Maloney what comes to mind. I hope I'm saying his name right. Oh, you've, you've got the spoon right there. Brilliant. I have the whole crate here. I've got a the mystery box. Um, so you can actually see the CPR emblem on that on that. <laughs> Well, all right. So let me let me explain a, a wee bit here. Um, I have a ton of spoons that were salvaged from the wreck of the Empress. Uh, oh, about a, a dozen or so of these. Wow. I don't know if you can see them well. Mm. Can you? Because I I can't see what my camera. No, sees. we can see it just fine. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to blow you up okay. a little bit so people can see better. Okay. Cool. So I, uh, some of them are, are really destroyed, like this one right here. You could actually see the silver plating peeling back. Um, the one that is pictured right there in, the, uh, in your presentation is this one right here. This is not from the Empress. Um, I saw this actually in an antique shop in Montreal, and I saw the CPR logo on it, and I wanted this as a display piece to go next to... The destroyed ones as a sort of before and after type thing but the, the one you're seeing there is not empress but it is of the era cpr brilliant because i just brought up this image here where we've got plates stacked with your yeah with two uh well a spoon from the wreck oh it's oh my stack that you were talking about yeah okay yeah. well it's it's kind of it's kind of funny because um in our previous call, when we were planning this, mm. you and I were talking about telling the Empress's story through the artifacts that we have in our collection, and then we very quickly realized that all of our pieces are from the dining room. So you can't really tell her full story from the perspective of the the kitchen. But um, yeah, I do have I do have those two plates that you see pictured in the photograph. And on the back, it has um, Minton's uh, Fontenay. Fontenay. Yeah. Minton's Fontenay, yes. They were the makers. And uh, there's also actual indented stamp on them. These were recovered from the wreck. These are not just period pieces. But what I... I do have a third dish of the same pattern, but what I found to be quite interesting at is... Do you notice anything? I don't know if the camera's going to pick it up, but do you notice anything about this one that's different from this one aside from size? For the I don't know if time, you do. It's no. <laughs> green. It's green. So it's... Um, what actually happened is the water soaked into the sealant on it, on, on, on into the glaze of the plate, and the green ink of the, um, the laurels and the oak leaves... Or, not oak, but the, the leaves around the edge started to bleed, all saturating underneath the glaze of the plate. So it's uh, wow. it has this almost complete green tinge to it. Oh, to the whole plate. Okay. Yeah. So um, I do have more. I could pull some more out. Yeah. I think but why I've don't got, you... I've got... Th this is an interesting one. I want to get to the condiment holder because I've done something you haven't seen this presentation yet I've done something cool where I've isolated it in a photograph from the Emperor so we'll, we'll uh... my condiment hole yeah check this out hang on I'll show you 
because I would love to know where this came from on board. I had not had time to research it. Oh, the bowl? What do you want? The no, condiment no, no, holder I've, or you're, the bowl? You're 30 seconds behind me, bearing in mind. So I've got a picture up of the, the condiment holder. And if I flick through to the next one, you can just see a uh, vaguely similar model sitting on the di first class dining saloon table where it was made up of four rings uh, mounted to a, a plate like the one you're holding up right now, Tom crossed over each other. You could just see one on the table. Is that what that looked like? Okay, well, I have two of them. I have three of them, actually. So, what, might they have gone crisscross in there, perhaps? It looks like it. I, I believe so. so something, if, if it's not that exact model, it must have been fairly similar. Um, but if all these artifacts are being pulled out of the first-class dining saloon, um, which I don't know where specifically. Yeah. Um, I just know that they were from the, somewhere on the rack. Amazing. And you've also got um, this, uh, the top of this decanter, um, or, or I think maybe a vinaigrette bottle. You can yeah. also see in that in that uh, picture, if we just flick through, yeah. you can just see it in the top of this. Yeah, you can see them in the tops of the bottles. Um, the only other actual salvaged artifact that I have. I do have a couple other things I want to show, hmm. but I have a stack of bowls. Wow. Which uh, you just flashed one up on on the screen hmm. right here. Unfortunately some of them are some of them are cracked. Some of them are outright shattered but pieced together. And uh, what do I, I have six. There's six of them. Oh, so I I love the yeah, isn't it? Isn't it gorgeous? Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'd love to find some use for them, you know, a display or something that I could lend them to. But they're just sitting in a box right now, and, and that's that's wrong. I'd love to be able to really share them with the world. I was planning to do a a video on my artifacts on my channel, but you, you know, I think your production values would be far higher than anything i've been able to accomplish tonight <laughs> tonight um, well, streams are all mess, but your vi your other videos that you make are quite good thank you I'm, I'm working on them um these two are really interesting you've got the the uh, canadian magazine advertiser um advertisement yeah. for the empress yeah to europe i was gonna bring that up when we were actually talking about it it talks about the the empress's uh, finest and fastest and 14 other modern Atlantic miners. Just subtitled down there. As well. um, it shows how, how, uh, and how high esteem CPI held these, these ships. Do you know when that um, dates to, that article? Or that little snippet? No, unfortunately. Mm. I don't. The finest and the fastest. They're fascinating. And uh, th this, this book as well, uh, there's such an interesting history be <laughs> behind these. So... This is actually another video I'd love to make at some point. Mm. Logan and Marshall, um, a lot of you have seen the Titanic books that they published within a month of the sinking. In fact, you might you might have one at your desk because I saw it, you had it yesterday. Yeah, Maybe I've, if you could hold it up. Have it. I've lost it. It's uh, somewhere. I'm sorry. Pretend. Everybody's seen it. It's that, it's that yellow book with a um, photo of the Titanic glued to the front of it. And these were nothing but cash grab books. And they were pieced together. 33% of it was excerpts from newspapers. 33% of it was like random people weighing in with like poems they wrote about it or um, whatnot. And then Forward the other 33%. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. And then the other 33% was like practically made up. So. These were nothing but cash grabs, and they did one on the Titanic, they did one on the Empress right here, and I've actually been collecting a, a whole bunch of them, I have about 20 different books by that publisher or similar publishers on all sorts of disasters. They did the Lusitania, they did the San Francisco earthquake, really? they did the, uh, yeah, the, they did the eruption and earthquake in Italy, um, and yeah. the Galveston flood, the fire of Boston, or something, one of, one of those great fires. So I was just 
collecting those because I'd like to do that, do a video on those as well and, and take some of it. It's really insightful to read through. You actually can glean some very interesting history out of it as long as you're taking it with a grain of salt and understanding that some of it is skewed, some of it is false. But there is... Often you'll find a story in here and, and you'll think, I bet there's a grain of truth to that. Let me look into it further elsewhere. And yeah. often you'll find something forgotten. So they're an incredible source. Especially being so fresh. I mean, this was, like you said, like a month after yeah. the disaster. Um, it's a time capsule of not just the facts, yes, but also exactly. the, the era, that, that era of like uh, uh, sensationalist journalism, selling copies, printed copies. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Great piece. So I didn't know that they were more than... I knew of the Empress, I knew of Titanic. I didn't know they did one for Lusitania. I didn't know they had a whole series. So I'd, if you make that video, oh, I, yeah. I would love to see that. That is that is super cool. How they made it work. And tell us about this little... Um, um, was this a commemorative uh, postcard woven in silk? What, what was this? Yeah. All right. So people have seen these at the Titanic and the Olympic. I've seen them circulating online. Um, and they have Empress of Ireland. I actually have... I don't know if you see the, the frames on my wall behind me, but most of those pictures back there are more of these silk postcards. They were sold on board the ships for the most part. Um, this one here in the frame actually was posted from the Empress of Ireland, and it was sent to Halifax. And um, they are... I guess they're highly sought after for certain ships. Like a Titanic one can fetch you several thousand. I don't have a Titanic one. But there's the Olympic, for example, would go for about 800. Wow. So there's, yeah, there's, um, these are an interesting collection piece. And for the most part, they were sold on board these liners. Wait, and they made much. them all, all, yeah, exactly. And they made them of all sorts of liners from the time. And they were all made by one company called Stephen Graff or something. If you're going to have a niche yeah. market or a niche product, do it well. And it seems that... Exactly. Said, That's another video I've been thinking of doing with I, the I, collection. I said earlier, you're the Ocean Liner Renaissance man, and you laughed at me, but it's, I've never seen you not busy. I'm, I'm, you strike me as a man who never gets bored. Um, a couple of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, from, uh, from my side, um, I'm just going to make myself a little bit bigger so you guys can see what I'm holding up. But um, Ooh, this little, this nice. is, yeah, this is a nice little color postcard. But what, what I think is interesting about it here is that that little line, go as your letters go um, and travel in safety and comfort. You know, again, we were talking earlier about the, the Atlantic being the final frontier. And that's, they're pushing this, we are the safest line. We are the most comfortable line. You know, you won't even know you're at sea almost. Um, so I, I just thought that was a nice little point. But like you, yeah. I've got a couple of bits that were recovered. And this, this thing for me, this piece is um, probably the pride and joy of my entire Ocean Liner collection of, of things. Um, a piece of a silver fruit bowl that was uh, recovered from the first class dining saloon. And what, if, if these artifacts can tell a story, um, this one just to me speaks of that. You can see the beauty of, of, the, of the silver work. You can see the beauty of it. Um, you can actually see it in this photograph, the exact same uh, silver fruit bowl. Um, that is bigger than I thought it was. I, I just saw your photograph of it. No, oh, that's quite a piece. But the decay of the, the beautiful floral work on it is it just, from spending so much time underwater, you know, it, it really is um, that, that strange thing. I th oh, who was it? Uh, I think it was either Ken Marshall or Bill Sorter talking about Titanic saying something like human hands built this of, you know, the, the beautiful um, carving in the Titanic that's still there, the woodwork human hands built this. And now it's, you know, two or three miles at the bottom of the ocean. It just shouldn't be there. It was never designed to be there. This was so much thought went into these things and to see them like this and then attach them to the human loss to me is, uh, is always very moving, but this is something that I, I cherish very dearly. Uh, I also picture just how much, you know, with the Empress laying on its side right now, just how much 
how many of these artifacts that, that we have are just laying down there, all pushed up against the one side of the room in in silt and other debris and who knows bodies. Yeah. Yeah, we know that that body parts have been um, taken as souvenirs, e even as early as the, the when the makeshift morgues were established. I think people were taking rings and things. Like that that yeah. fascination with disaster. Um, it's disgusting, but it's common. They were doing that with the Atlantic as well and the Lusitania. Yeah, yeah. Not the, I didn't know that about the Atlantic. Goodness, it's it was it was that it was a different time. People were. As people are fascinated now by morbidity, back then as well, I, I think there was a real draw. You saw postcards of, you know, yeah, things. It's interesting. Yeah, if, if we do another one on the, the Eastland, like we were talking about, I've got a stack of body recovery postcards. They're horrific. But back then, it was a different mindset mm. because they were cutting pieces of hair off of the bodies that were pulled up off of the Atlantic. Now, when they were pulling fingers off of the Empress bodies, that was because they were wearing jewelries, and that was purely for the sake of grave robbing, if you will. Mm -hmm. But um, snipping hair off, I feel, has a different intonation, because the Victorians often did that when their loved ones died before they buried them they would actually cut a lock of their hair off and, and frame it. Mm. And um, it was as a memento of, of their death. You actually have this, especially since hair does not decay. Um, so, I don't know. I, a lot of souvenir hunting back then was for morbid reasons, but I also wonder just how much of it was sincere Victorian and Edwardian um, memorialism yeah okay interesting it's just a different mindset that we can't put ourselves we can't maybe relate to it as much but well you, you, to you? Your point, you know those photographs of um people posing with their dead loved ones and trying to make them look alive and their whole photography studios around yeah there. yeah they were, they were used to death death was a fact of life not that it isn't anymore but um but it was so common back then, you know, like you had a 50, 50 chance of your child dying in the first mm -hmm. four years of its life. Uh, and then there were so many illnesses. There were so many disasters that were far more widespread than they are now. It's, um, people just took it, accepted it and, um, wore a lot of black. Yeah. yeah. Black was in there. Yeah. Well, I, on a slightly lighter note, I, there was a post I read the other day, something like what would have killed you in your lifetime now if you had been born yeah. in the 1800s and for me it was appendicitis at 15 that makes sense yeah i can see that <laughs> do i look like someone who would have appendicitis at 15 yes you do <laughs> i just have that air um yeah. this, I this thought little, that the the, <laughs> i'm not inviting you back um this uh this little fragment because yours are in perfect condition and are uh, preserved, you wonder if they were stacked. Yes. You wonder if they were stacked in a cupboard. Because the, my little fragment here is in a, is a tiny piece of the plate that you've got. This one here, this beautiful pattern on it. Um, you can clearly see that this would have been set that night on the, uh, on the, dining saloon tables in first class for breakfast the next morning and then as the ship rolled uh all of the plates and things like you said went spewing onto the other side of the other side of the ship up against the the um the bulkhead but you can just imagine that night the steward setting the table for um for breakfast the next morning before going to bed and i often look at these things and think the last set of human hands to touch these before she sank you know, did that steward make it? Was this one of the last things that someone touched and very carefully, lovingly placed on a table for for breakfast? The piece that you own, the piece that you own. I, I can't quite tell when you hold it up. What what would you say that that is? Is that a dinner plate, a, a bread plate, or a saucer? What? How big would you? What plate is that a fragment? Uh, it does have a little think? label on the back when this was recovered by Bart Maloney. Oh. And he's, he's just said it was a, a first-class uh, dinner plate. So this could just be the, the rim of a, of a dinner plate, but it does have yeah, a, that... a curved profile, so I'm not entirely sure. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's it's just amazing uh, the, the little stories that these things can can tell. Um, and yeah. Probably the most underrated. Not underrated. Sorry, that's a bad choice of words. The thing that if you were to look at the things that I've got and immediately dismiss it, I, I got this for ten dollars on eBay. Um, this is a uh, signed theater sheet, and Tom, I'm just going to get you out of the way for a minute. Oh, uh, okay. I'm just going to pop you. No, no, all good. I'll pop you just aside so people can just see the the, the writing. Yeah, no. <laughs> He's still there, folks. Don't worry. I'm um, being goofy. Signed by. Uh, Lawrence Irving and his, his wife, Mabel Hackney, who were um, fairly famous actors of their time of the stage. You can see it's signed by her on top and then uh, Lawrence immediately afterwards. Lawrence's uh, father was a, a famous English actor um, and Mabel was a famous actor in her own right and um, they, they were extremely well known and they'd been touring Canada um, after having a, had a string of hits together, they, they acted together very frequently. Um, I love this photograph of them uh, in the in the stage play Typhoon. That's the little little sheet that they that they signed, which was a theater sheet when he was managing one of the um, one of the theaters, the Duke of York's theater. And uh, tragically, both lost. I think these would have to be probably the most high profile passengers on board that that night. Um, and maybe a little echo of you know captain smith and the baby there were a lot of sightings of them right at the end but nobody knows exactly what happened and their bodies were never recovered so they they, they could you know still be uh still be out there it's just it's uh yeah it's just it, we were talking about the human tragedies and stories that played out these were people that they were booked to go on another liner the day after the empress but wanted to get a head start and so rebooked to travel on the empress of ireland and they uh, they shouldn't have been there. So, yeah, this is a this is a picture. I think this is the the Saint Lawrence the the next morning or around about the time that the Empress uh, Empress sank. You could just see the haze on the horizon. And I thought this would be a nice photograph to to end on as some kind of tribute to the people who were who were who were lost. And this is where they uh, they currently still uh, are located. It's chilling. It looks like a cold, cold morning. It does, doesn't it? It really, it really does. But uh, I, I like to remember the the the, um, the ships like this. I I just noticed you can see the Empress of Britain uh, just down in the corner there, which is a, a nice little touch. Beautiful, beautiful painting. This one. Yep. So um, that's that's it for the presentation. I, what I'll do, I'll just flick back to uh, to see if we had any more comments um, or questions that we could we could address. But uh, Tom, this has been really, really enjoyable. I think uh, we've done all right, considering we're not, we're certainly not experts on the topic. Yeah, I was nervous coming into this because when you asked me, hey, you want to do a Empress of Ireland chat with me? And I'm like, not, not really. I don't know much about the Empress, not as much as I'd like to, but I think, I think we did all right. I'm, I'm very impressed, by the way, with a lot of the comments coming through in the, in the chat um, a lot of knowledge as well in the in the comment section, which is awesome. Yeah, and people are very passionate, and that's amazing to see. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's lovely that we you know we can retell these stories. It's well over a uh, hundred years later, and we can um, yeah re reflect back on uh, on what happened. So yeah, yeah, it's good because it it goes without without much acknowledgement. Yeah, and uh, it it's good to be able to, to give it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I know other people were, but, but still. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And uh, yeah, again, like I, I wanted to try and keep the tone of this, this uh, conversation fairly subdued. I didn't want to joke around, um, around too much. And I know the story is a, a bit of a, uh, uh, it's, it's a tragic one, but uh, hopefully Tom, we can do another video or some kind of stream soon where we can have, uh, have a little fun. Yeah, I, well, I, I enjoy talking to you, and it's it's fun when we don't have to be so somber and um, dealing with such a serious topic. Obviously, you know, that's not fun, but it's still enjoyable speaking with you and, and, and covering these stories, but it's nice to um, it's nice to be able to just banter and not have to 
deal with such serious subjects as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, there's a there's a time and place for both. So uh, no, look, thanks, exactly. thanks so much for agreeing to do this. I know this was a kind of a last minute uh, last minute thing, but uh, I think it worked out really well. I just wanted to thank everyone for for tuning in. I think we maintained about forty or fifty uh, viewers the entire way. So thanks for everyone for showing up. Thanks to Chelsea for moderating yes. the moderating the chat. I don't think she had to get rid of any comments. <laughs> I think everyone here was just genuinely very passionate about about the Good. Of yeah. Thank you everybody for tuning in. And again, thank you Chelsea for, for managing that chat and for compiling the questions and comments document as we were going through it. Yeah, great stuff. And uh, Tom, we'll see you again. Thanks so much everybody for tuning in. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna wrap it up, but uh, we will, we'll see you again there and uh, have, a, have a lovely night. Bye everybody. Ciao.